Please remain standing if you would. We'd like to acknowledge where our authority comes from. Isn't it good to be part of a church where people have been married 70 years? Wow, that's awesome. Uh, please repeat after me. This is my Bible. God's holy word. There's a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. It is inerrant. It is infallible. It is authoritative. It is sharper than any two-edged sword. It is a fire shut up in my bones. I must speak it. It's food for my soul. I am ready to receive it. We're going to go to Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah chapter 9. We're studying the names of Jesus. And uh, we're reminded today that he has a name for every need. And Jesus is the biggest need we all have in our lives. Isaiah chapter 9 is a prophecy written 700 years before the coming of Christ. This is what Isaiah predicted. For unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder. His name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it and establish it with justice and judgment from that time forward. Even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Thank you. Please be seated. Today, if you came in and you're struggling with some anxiety and some worry and some concerns and some burdens, I want to remind you that there's hope. If you need wisdom for a big decision, or maybe you're in the midst of an overwhelming situation and you need direction, I want you to know there is hope. If you've got a situation that nobody can fix, it's a God-sized situation, I want you to know that God is big enough. I want to remind you that if you're looking in a, in a time of uh, upheaval, maybe just feeling it from the world or in your own life, if you need a stable and secure place, we've got an answer for you today. And today's message is for you. Isaiah 9 tells us that Jesus is an answer to every one of those needs. Now, this is one of several of his prophecies. Isaiah 7 says, Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. Um, and Isaiah 7 says, The virgin shall conceive and bear a son and call his name Emmanuel. Telling us that he's going to be God in a human body, miraculously conceived in the womb of a virgin, 100% God, 100% man, God with us. Isaiah 53, Isaiah predicted that the Messiah was not coming as a revolutionary for political upheaval. He was coming to bear our sorrows, carry our griefs, wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. The punishment for our sins was laid upon him. By his stripes we are healed. He was coming to die for our sins. But in Isaiah 9, we just have this incredibly wonderful prophecy telling us that Jesus is the wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Everything you need is wrapped up in Jesus Christ. But you're only going to experience that you will only experience the fullness of his blessing when you submit to the fullness of his authority because he's also the king of kings. 
This Christmas, I want to appeal to you. I want to beg you. I want to encourage you that if you never have made Jesus the Lord of your life, there's no better time than today. And I want to encourage you, if you've gotten to where you've climbed back onto the throne of your life or you've got an area of your life where you're experiencing uh, conflict or concern or, or struggle, submit that area of your life to Jesus Christ because he is the king of kings. We can only experience the fullness of his blessing when we submit to the fullness of his authority as king of kings and king of us in our lives. So let's look at these names together. And these are five reasons why you ought to make Jesus the king of your life. Number one, he's a wonderful counselor. He's the wonderful counselor. Amen. Amen. Yes, indeed. Every one of us faced a series of decisions in life. Are we going to go to college? Where are we going to work? Are we going to get married? Who are we going to marry? Are we going to have kids? How many kids? Where are we going to move? Are we going to move to another house, move to another job? We face a lot of decisions in life. We need direction. We need a counselor. All of us get hit with situations where we don't have the answer. We don't know what to do. We need a wonderful counselor. Jesus is the wonderful counselor. And I just want to remind you that you will never know God's will until you know God. And you will never know God's uh, will until you know his word. And you will never experience his will until you submit to his word. You see, the will of God is not a cafeteria where I go, well, I'll, uh, tell me what you got, God, and I'll decide whether I want to do it or not. God's will is God will tell you after you're willing to do whatever he says for you. When you're willing to do whatever, then God's willing to tell you what whatever would be. Well, let me give you a two deep theological thoughts. A... Jesus is smart. A theologian would say he's omniscient, meaning infinite, unbounded in knowledge. Jesus has unlimited wisdom, knowledge, insight, understanding. He's infinite. He has unlimited knowledge of all things, past, present, and future, and actual or possible. Think about that. He knows everything that can be known about everything. Everything that ever was, is, or will be, or could be. Jesus is smart. You need to trust him as the wonderful counselor. When it comes to your situation, I just want to encourage you. God is eternal, which means he know, he's seen it. He's seen it before in the past. He is right now in the present, and he knows the future, and he knows possible futures. If you're at, trying to look for direction, I want you to know that he's omniscient. He knows everything about you. He knows more about you than you know about yourself, and he knows everything about your situation more than anybody else does. I want to encourage you that he not only knows the, the situation, he knows what to do about it, and how to do it. Jesus is smart. Tell the person next to you, Jesus is smart. Yes, he is. You ought to trust him. He's a wonderful counselor. Second big thought about Jesus is he's willing to share his wisdom with us. It's not like he's really smart and he goes, yeah, I'm really smart, but I'm not telling you. Guess. No, I love James chapter 1. It says in verse 5, if any, of us, if any of you lacks wisdom, which would be all of us, let him ask of God who gives all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given unto him. I've learned that when I don't know what to do, the right thing to do is to pray. Sometimes, you know, every week I'm talking to people in 
overwhelming situations, and I'm like, I don't know what to tell them. I don't know what to do. That's a big problem. I, whew. I've learned to just shoot those arrow prayers up to God, and it's amazing. You've seen this happen in your life. All of a sudden, what's coming out of your mouth is better what, than what's in your head, right? That's the wonderful counselor. I, uh, when it comes to big decisions, I've learned if I keep praying, God will keep giving me pieces of the puzzle. It's amazing. He's a wonderful counselor. I don't know what you're facing today. I don't know what decisions you're facing. I don't know what situations you are facing. But I, I want to tell you, Jesus is a wonderful counselor. He's smart enough for your situation, and he's willing to give you wisdom. But you will only experience the fullness of his wisdom when you submit to the fullness of his authority. For him to be the wonderful counselor, you got to get the whole picture. He's also the king of kings. The second name of Jesus we want to talk about, the second reason why we need to uh, make him the king of our lives is he's the mighty God. We could talk all day about Jesus being God, 100% God, fully God, and that God is infinite in every direction, knowledge, time, understanding, love, truth, justice, but he's also infinite in power. A, Jesus is strong enough. He's not only smart enough, he's strong enough. A theologian would say he's omnipotent. Unlimited power. All power. He has all power, strength, authority, and energy. You've never gone to God with a situation and God go, Woo, that's a big one. <laughs> Good luck with that, pal. God is strong enough for your situation. All of us cut, will run into situations in our life that are bigger than we can handle, more powerful than we can do anything about. We feel hopeless and helpless in those situations. I want you to know Jesus is strong enough for your situation today. You say, well, you don't know my situation. I say, you don't know my Jesus. He's strong enough. Isaiah 40, 28, it says, Don't you know, haven't you heard, the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, does not become weary or weak. You know, you've got to understand this. Look at me. God's not like getting old. He's not like, well, I used to be really good at those miracle things. But my arthritis... My blood pressure is a problem. <laughs> God is the same age he's always been. He lives outside of time because he's infinite. He's not one bit older or younger, weaker or stronger. When you're infinitely strong, you're infinitely strong. It says in uh, Psalm 147, Great is our Lord, abundant in strength. I love Jeremiah 32, 17. All sovereign Lord, you made the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched arm. Here you go. Nothing is too hard for you. Nothing's too hard for God. God Jesus is strong enough. Second, Jesus can be trusted to do the impossible. One day, an, a a an angel, Gabriel, shows up at a teenage girl uh, home, Mary, and says, Hey, honey, I want you to know you're going to have a baby. She's like, I can't have a baby. I'm a virgin. He said, Don't worry about it. Luke 1, For with God, all things are possible. Is it possible for a virgin to have a baby? No. That's not the right question. Is it possible for an infinite, almighty God to cause a virgin to have a baby? Absolutely. 
because he's strong enough. A little over a year ago, Kathy and I uh, had some situations in our family that felt absolutely hopeless and helpless. We were helpless and hopeless in the face of these situations. They seemed absolutely impossible. We determined to really seriously pray like never before. We fasted like never before. And to be honest with you, nothing happened. We went back and submitted these situations as far as our part is concerned deeper than we ever have before. And I can tell you today, in all these situations... We've seen the hopeless turn into the hopeful. We've seen God do the impossible in situations because that's just who he is. He's the mighty God. He's the Prince of Peace. But you only experience the fullness of his wisdom and power when you submit to the fullness of his authority. He's also the King of Kings. Third name I want to give you is the Everlasting Father. The Everlasting Father. This world's crazy. Yeah? <laughs> Never has any group of people in history gone through so much change as us right now in this time in history. It's unbelievable. Let me give you a couple examples. The speed of travel. How do, you, how do you get a group of people from here to there most quickly? For thousands of years, the fastest way was a camel caravan traveling at eight miles an hour. <laughs> Finally, the end of the 1700s, they came up with the stagecoach. Now you could go... 10 miles an hour. The 1800s, they invented the steam locomotive. Hang on. 13 miles an hour. 100 years later, the airplane. 100 miles an hour. Now airplanes are going thousands of miles an hour. The rate of speed of travel has increased exponentially. Knowledge. I don't know how they figured this out. But they say if we took all the knowledge from the beginning of time up until the birth of Jesus, that would be one unit of knowledge. For that to double took 1,500 years. Two units of knowledge. For that to double again took 300 years four units of knowledge. For that to double again took 150 more years, eight units of knowledge. Today, it's doubling every one to two years because of the Internet and the computer. No wonder we don't feel like we can, can't keep up. We can't keep up. Things change. Our worlds get turned upside down. Is there anybody in here that... that Wonders, you know, you just kind of miss going downtown to Lazarus and looking at the window there. <laughs> Stuff changes. I grew up in Chillicothe, the metropolis of Chillicothe. <laughs> I went by my middle school. Gone! <laughs> my elementary school. Gone! <laughs> Drove by my parents' house. They've been gone for quite a while. It, you, it's always yellow. It's green. <laughs> What's going on? <laughs> Kathy and I have been here a little over three years. People that we met when we first came are no longer here. Gone. Into eternity. Maybe your world's been rocked this year. Maybe somebody you love is gone. Maybe your life has been radically changed. I want you to know there's an everlasting father. Now, some of you are like, now, Dave, I have a problem. 
How can Jesus be the Son of God and the everlasting Father? Contradiction in the Bible. I don't think so. First, realize Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are three expressions of the same thing, the same DNA, God. One DNA, three expressions, so we can understand it. Second, realize that the word father doesn't always mean the, the biological father of something. It also can mean the originator of something. Alexander Graham Bell, the father of the telephone. Did he birth a telephone? <laughs> no, he originated the telephone. James Naismith, the father of basketball. Did he birth a basketball? Hey, honey, look what happened. Did, no. He originated, created basketball. The Wright brothers, the airplane. Did they birth an airplane? No, they originated an airplane. Jesus is the originator of eternity. A, he's the father of eternity. It started with him. He's eternal. And by the way, Jesus did not begin in Bethlehem. He didn't begin nine months earlier. Jesus has always been and will always be because he's God and he's eternal and he's infinite in reference to time. He has no time. He has no age. He's ageless. But because he loves us, he took a human body and he accepted finiteness and stepped from eternity into time so that he could become our Savior. Just another reason to praise him. I wouldn't do that. Especially for these people down here, these rebellious people like me. Uh, B, Jesus provides eternal life. He's the only one that can give you eternal life because he's the father of eternity. John 3, 16, God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. John 10, 28, and I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. See, Jesus provides a place of security. Deuteronomy 33, 27. This is a great verse. It says, The eternal God is your refuge, and underneath are the everlasting arms. If you feel like everything's changing around you, it is. But there's an eternal refuge and everlasting arms that are always safe and secure. He's the everlasting Father. Psalm 90 says, Lord, you have been our dwelling place throughout all generations before the mountains were born, or you brought forth the whole world from everlasting to everlasting. You are God. Maybe your world's been turned upside down this year. Maybe Christmas is going to be really hard because it's going to be different, and you're feeling not a good different. There's everlasting arms. There's a secure refuge. He's an eternal father. You can experience the security, the stability of an everlasting God. But you'll only experience the fullness of that when you submit to the fullness of his authority in your life. The last name and my favorite is the Prince of Peace. Prince of Peace. Anybody in this room have the unspiritual gift of worry? I do. I'm analytic. I can figure out 50 things that could go wrong. Jesus is the Prince of Peace. And the word peace in English is so limited. In Hebrew, it's awesome. A, the, word, the Hebrew word for peace is the Hebrew word shalom. Say shalom. 
Shalom's an awesome word. It's much bigger than our word for peace. Our word for peace means the absence of hostility. This means that and so much more. It means the state of well-being of tranquility, prosperity, and security. It speaks of inner and outer health, wholeness, harmony. It speaks of inner and outer peace and prosperity. It speaks of inner and outer vigor and vitality, goodness, and grace. It means every, everything's right in, in here. You experience shalom when four things happen. First of all, your relationship with God is right. And you'll never experience the rest of it until you start there. When everything's right between me and God, I can experience shalom. And then God enables that to bring about, as far as I'm concerned, everything right between me and others. I can't control them, but I can control me. And as far as I'm concerned, everything is, is as good as it can be between me and them. Third, it's when everything is good with me in the realities of an ungood world. Crazy, sinful, messed up, weird world. I can be good in the midst of that. I can have peace in the midst of that. Shalom. Everything is right in relationship with myself. The fourth one. Emotionally, mentally, physically, spiritually, I'm at peace. That's what shalom means. B, Jesus, shalom is available because Jesus is the Prince of Peace. This would be a, a very discouraging word if it wasn't for Jesus. Yet because of Jesus, we can experience this. That's awesome. Jesus is the Prince of Peace because Jesus can bring lasting peace between us and God, man with man, man with himself, man with the world. Jesus is the Prince of Peace. Think about Jesus when he came. He kept promising to give us peace. He's getting ready to be crucified, and he says to his disciples, Peace I live, leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. He's getting ready to be crucified, and he said, These things I have spoken unto you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you'll have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. Jesus is the one that provides peace between us with God. Romans 5, 1 says, We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Look at me. This is the problem. We sin. And our sin creates a wall. It's like every sin is a brick between me and God, and it creates a wall between me and God. God is, is the source of shalom. But we are blocked out from that. Jesus stepped out of eternity, gave up all the benefits of superpowers of being God to become one of us, to live a sinless life and die on a cross to experience separation for us to tear down the wall between us and God. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust to bring us to God. The wall is torn down. We can experience the goodness, the grace, and the peace of God. Through Jesus Christ. And he's the only way. No other religion works. And this really isn't a religion. This is just awesome. Jesus promised peace. See, how do I experience it? Shalom is experienced when we actively trust the Prince of Peace. It's all there, but you might not be experiencing it. How do you experience it? Let me give you... Four suggestions. Number one, trust Jesus as your Savior. Dude, if you're not saved, you're on the wrong side of the wall. There's only one way to get on the right side, and that's through faith in Jesus Christ, the one that died to tear down the wall. 
You want to experience shalom? Be born again by faith in Jesus Christ. Today, today's a great day for this. Second, turn your problems into prayer. Let me give you three great verses. Philippians 4, 6, and 7. Be anxious for nothing. You say, that's easy for you to say. How? By everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding. You say, this, this situation is so overwhelming. You can have peace in the midst of the most overwhelming situation. The peace of God that surpasses all understanding shall guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Turn your problems into prayer. What I do every morning, I write down the things I got to do, and I write down the things I'm worried about. Give them to God. Turn them with thanksgiving. God, I thank you you're going to work in this today. You're going to be active in this area today. Instead of concern and anxiety, I experience peace. Turn your worry list into your prayer list. Second scripture is 1 Peter 5, 6 through 8. Listen very carefully. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. Listen, casting all your cares upon him for he cares for you. Listen, be sober, be vigilant because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Okay, look at me. How many of you ever feel like you've been devoured by worry and anxiety? You don't have to raise your hand. You know, you get going and it's like your mind just takes off and you get this download of all this, all the negative, all the negative. It's just, that's the enemy devouring you with worry and anxiety. So what do you do? You do what the verse ahead of it says. Cast all your care upon him. I don't have to... I, you, you, I, no, no, no. I've given that to God. I give it to God and say, God, this is yours to worry about. Help me do what I need to do. Help me not do what I don't need to do about this. Turn your problems into prayer. David... David is running through the wilderness trying to stay alive with an army chasing him. And this is what he says, I sought the Lord and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. I prayed and God took away the fear. You don't have to live in fear, worry, and anxiety. Learn to live in thankful prayer, faith-filled prayer. Third, keep trusting in Jesus. Isaiah 26, 3, you might need to memorize this one. You will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Look at me. This is how it works. You start worrying and you look at your problems and they get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and more complicated with longer tentacles and you get eaten up. Don't do that. Look at God. How big is God? Big enough. How smart is God? How strong is God? You look at God who's infinite, and your problems are going to just shrink down. And don't even waste time looking at those. Look at God. Keep your mind fixed on Him. Worship Him. Maybe you need to listen to more prayer, uh, worship music in your car, in your house. Maybe you need to read more scripture. Keep your minds on God, mind on God, and he will give you peace. Number four, be surrendered to the Holy Spirit. For to set my, uh, the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. When I surrender something to God, the Holy Spirit brings peace in my life. The, Holy, the fruit of the Spirit is, listen, unconditional love, joy, peace, and patience. So if I'm not experiencing that, I'm not filled with the fruit of the Spirit. 
If I'm not experiencing the fullness of the Spirit, it's because I'm not surrendered to the Holy Spirit. I Maybe you're like me. I don't worry in the daytime. Not much. About 3.30, 4 o'clock at night is when I do. Anybody else like that? I mean, it just starts going. And, it, it, you know, it looks worse and worse and worse. And I'm not awake enough to feel, you know, it's just nasty right there, half awake, half asleep. I have learned. I've got to give my worries to God. Thank him with thanksgiving that he is going to work in those areas today. He is working. And thank him that he knows what he's doing. And he's big enough to do, do it. I look at him and thank him and praise him for who he is instead of what's going on. And then I submit it deeper to God. Listen to me very carefully. Any area of my life that is not submitted to God will become a source of concern and conflict. If I am worried about something... That's a great indication I haven't really fully given it to God or I've taken it back. Because if I'm trusting him with it, I'm not, you can't trust and worry at the same time. You can't worship and worry at the same time. Jesus is the Prince of Peace. But you're only going to experience the fullness of that peace in your situation when you have submitted to the fullness of his authority in your life. Jesus, Prince of Peace, Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father. You don't have to live in anxiety. He can do the impossible. You don't have to feel unstable and all shook up. He's awesome. But only when, number five, you allow him to be who he is. Because you get the whole package, the king of kings. Jesus is the king of kings. Unto us a child. This is a sandwich. This passage is a sandwich. Notice how it opens up. Unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. And the government will be upon his shoulders. He's going to be a king. Then it says his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, etc. And then it says, Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end upon the throne of David and over his kingdom. The goodies in the middle are sandwiched by the fact that he's the king of kings and the lord of lords. You can't just pick and choose with God. I want him to be this, but I don't really like that part. <laughs> he is who he is. When you, when you get God, you get all that he is, which is awesome because most of us only scratch the surface of what God could be in our lives couple quick thoughts. Jesus is the king of kings. When Jesus was born, the wise men show up. This is crazy. These guys come all the way from, from Babylon, and, and they show up in this little tiny uh, village of Bethlehem, and they give gifts to a baby that you would not give a baby. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Myrrh is what you use on a dead body. Frankincense is, is what you use to worship a god. Gold is what you give a king. A dead body because he'd have to die to be our savior. Incense because he's God. Gold because he's the king of kings. Paul writes a little doxology at the end of uh, 1 Timothy, and he says, the talking about Jesus, he says, the blessed and only sovereign, the king of kings and the lord of lords. B, Jesus will return to rule and reign. He didn't come to establish an earthly kingdom the first time. He had to die for our sins the first time. 
to make it possible so that he can come back and establish an earthly kingdom. Daniel 7 says, To him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. An everlasting, he's coming to establish on this earth an everlasting kingdom. The last, one of the last pictures we see of Jesus is in Revelation 19, and it says he's coming in on a white horse, and on his robe and his thigh he had a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And his kingdom's going to be a peaceful, shalom-filled kingdom. Listen to what it says in Isaiah. The wolf will lie down with the lamb, the leopard lie down with the goat, the calf, and the young lion together, and a, young, a little child will lead them. It's going to be the safest, stablest, perfectest place you could ever imagine. It says, They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Jesus is the King of kings. But... We only experience the fullness of the blessing of that if we submit to the fullness of his authority in our life. Today, in this room, some of you, today's going to be an awesome day for you because you're going to submit your whole life to Jesus Christ. You've never done that. You're going to experience salvation and all the other good stuff that comes with it. Hallelujah. Some of you have done that, but you kind of stepped off, pushed him off the throne a little bit, and crawled back up there. And you've been trying to run your life, and today you're going to go, Ah, uh, Jesus, I'm getting off the throne. You be the Lord of Lords of me. Would you bow your heads? Who would lift a hand and say this? I have one area of my life that has been a, a concern to me, and I realize today as you've been talking, I need to submit that area more deeply to God. I have one area in my life that's been a concern and I need to submit it to God. Would you lift your hands all over the room and hold them up? Just hold them up. My concern, my anxiety, my worry is a testimony of the fact I need to submit this deeper to God. Just hold them up there and, and open your hand up and just let it go right now. Just let that go. Let that go. Lots of us today. Lots of us today. You may put your hands down. I wonder who would say, you know what? I need to submit my whole life to Jesus. Maybe you've never done it, or maybe it was, it's been a while, but you've crawled back on that throne, and you just need, need to come back under his lordship you need to submit your life to him. Would you raise your hand real high right now? Raise your hand real high. I need to submit my whole life to Jesus. I see several hands. Just raise them up. Raise them up right now. Say, here it is, God. Here's my life. I give it all to you. All to you, God. All to you. All to you. Thank you so much. You may put your hands down. I wonder who would say, Dave, it's my past. The devil just uses my past to beat me up. And today, that's over. I'm submitting that to God. I'm giving my past to God. Just lift your hand to God and say, you got my past. I give that to you. The devil can't use it against me anymore. I see lots of hands. The devil cannot use this against me anymore. Just raise those hands. Thank you. You may put them down. And I wonder who would say, you know what, it's, it's the future. I'm just not seeing it. There's this future situation that I, I, just my future. I need to give my future to God and trust him with it. Would you just lift your hand up to God? I give the future to you, God. 
quite a few of us. Just hold him there. Here it is, God. I let go of it today. I let go of it. I give this to you. Thank you, God. Father, in the name of Jesus, as we... As we make efforts to express our desire for you to be the King of kings and Lord of lords of every aspect of our lives, we ask you to just open the door of blessing in those areas of our life. There's people needing wisdom. There's people needing peace. There's people needing miracles. There's people, God, today needing security and stability. You are all that and so much more. There's people needing eternal life today. Thank you for being all of that, God. We thank you. In a moment, we're going to sing.